Hello, everybody, and welcome to our fascinating medical sciences lecture titled What is Performing Arts Medicine and Why Are Artists' Health Needs So Important? Thank you very much to all of you for joining us this evening. My name is Sata Diop. I am a current MSI Medical Innovation Enterprise student here at UCL, and I'll be your chair for today's event. Um, today's lecture will address how medicine and related health services can inspire and create a safe environment for our artists. We want to keep these lectures as interactive as possible, so please make good use of our Q&A function on Zoom throughout to submit your questions for our speaker, Dr. Hara Truly, and hashtag to use on Twitter for this event is hashtag FMS lectures. That's hashtag FMS lectures. I am now delighted to introduce our speaker. We have Hara Truly. Dr. Hara Truly is Associate Professor and Performing Arts Medicine Clinician at UCL. Hara studied medicine at the Athens Medical School and piano diploma at the National, National Athens Conservatoire. She has worked in surgery, orthopedics and musculoskeletal medicine. She studied for the first master's in performing arts medicine at University College London, a course she now leads since 2015 and where she teaches, organizes, teaches, organizes curriculum and supervises research. Thank you very much, Dr. Truly, for joining us today. And now over to you. Thank you very much, Sapia. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to um, join you today and join, of course, our audience on this uh, faculty uh, medical sciences uh, lecture. I hope you hear me well. So um, if I don't hear any complaints, I'll just carry on now. And uh, I'm absolutely thrilled that you give me this opportunity to speak to a wider audience about performing arts medicine. A lot of uh, people um, they don't know, even colleagues, medical colleagues of mine, they don't know very well what performing arts medicine is about. So here's a huge opportunity for us as well. But also it's not an opportunity just for us uh, that work in performing arts medicine. I think it's a very good opportunity for our performers as well. This is a group, um, if you like, a group of patients, although I won't talk as if they are patients, uh, at least in, in this talk, uh, it's a population group that uh, needs medical help very often and medical help from various disciplines. So performing arts medicine is a multidisciplinary field of medicine. And you will understand why as I move on with the, with the talk today. So why do we need performing arts medicine? Our performing artists of all forms and types and again, we will break it down a little bit later on. You have to remember how extensive training they undergo, how they may engage in professional careers that have injury risks by definition, how they face various social pressures to perform on stage in front of audiences, and how some of these pressures, for various reasons again, can produce increased mental stresses. So how can we help prevent these problems? This is part of our performing arts medicine remit. How can we eventually look after our artists if something goes wrong? Why are these problems specific to artists? Or if not specific, why are they more important for these professionals? And do we have the medical expertise and the resources to look after them? And finally, do these artists are aware of the health risks themselves? Okay, I'm moving you now, I'm transferring you to a different area of medicine, and this is sports medicine. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with pictures like this. And just to warn you, the pictures I'm using for this talk are just pictures picked from the internet and used here. Um, to avoid really any um, privacy of our own um, uh, artists that we have treated and we treat. So just, just the public domain uh, pictures here. So looking at these uh, pictures, I'm sure you're all familiar with the odd injury on the pitch, uh, the first aider attending uh, straight away on the field to treat the injured athlete. And then, of course, you know, the ice packs, the stretches coming and occasionally removing that uh, athlete from the pitch. Now, I'm just going to ask a question to the audience. Um, 
just just for reflection really how often do we see this in a dancing performance how often would you ever see this in a musical performance even if we move towards the more sort of athletic perform performers like the circus artists how many of you will have seen that in a circus performance if you go to Cirque du Soleil type of performances how many of you will see a physio running into the on, on the stage or wherever that takes place to offer uh, emergency services and of course the athletes we remain again in the um, in this in the in the sports uh, medicine uh, applications the athletes will undergo various management. Some of them will may have medical or surgical treatment, for example, and then they will um, spend some time in the rehabilitation rooms, going through very personalized programs, recovery programs, and then functional recovery programs to go back to that specific sport that they do. So this is the story with the athletes. And we move now to our performers. And I will start with the dancers, because the dancers are the performers who are closer to what one would think as an athlete. And these are athletes, um, creative athletes, if you like. These are people who use their body to the extremes, a little bit like the athletes, but also to give us the creative result that we go to the theatre or we attend a performance for uh, in order to appreciate their art and their creativity. How often when we watch a dance show or a musical, let's say if we're in London in the West End, uh, with the plethora of musical events we have, how often do we think of an injury? Whereas when we go to a football match or a rugby match, I think an injury is more or less on the agenda. I think I should be fair and say that, particularly for the dancing community, there is um, a, an increasing awareness of the injuries for reasons that we all understand. And the dancing companies, most of them, the bigger companies, they're lucky to have in-house uh, medical professionals, such as physiotherapists, maybe um, a specialized doctor, uh, for immediate referrals and others. The dancing community is lucky from that perspective and they have gained some uh, progress in terms of having attention for their own dances. Some of the dance schools, particularly here in the UK that I'm aware of, they have their in-house specialists and teams, health teams as well. So if we think about the dancers as athletes, we can um, start thinking about the common aspects of their work. But if I may, I would like to add a plus for the dancers. So the common aspects are the number of injuries that can happen, the increased workload, a lot of preparation for these people to reach the level that they need to reach for a performance, the technical difficulties, fatigue, a very strong aspect that comes with a preparation for a dancing performance or a sports event. And of course, issues around endurance, the stamina that these people have to run the shows, to run uh, their uh, athletic events. But if we think again about the dancers, we should think about more things that come into play here. The dancer is not only to uh, produce that physical uh, result they're there to produce the aesthetic result and I think this is what us as the audience are going to the theatre to appreciate they have to wear strange costumes sometimes they can't all perform in leotards and sort of uh, shorts and t-shirts they have to wear um, creative costumes and they have to work within a choreography, which means that they will have to synchronize themselves, discipline themselves to dance with others and to dance alongside music, for example. And then other risk factors come into play, like the lights 
the floors, the shoes they wear, and many, many others. So here is my surprising figures. Where are the dancers' injuries statistics? I have statistics from slightly older uh, reviews, but these were the bigger reviews we have to date. And here you see quite a percentage between 67 and 95 percent of an injury existing on an annual basis. And one would say, gosh, what happens with all these uh, people who get injured? Do they all go eventually to the hospital, perhaps to the emergency department if necessary, or somebody attends to them? And the answer is unfortunately not. I would say probably from my clinical experience that about half of these injuries will be attended by medical professionals, one way or the other. The rest of them will be either self-treated or the dancers or the um, prospective dancers, the students perhaps, they will rely on their teachers to help them overcome an injury. Some of them, however, will go completely unreported and the dancer will sort of try to self-treat, self-heal or allow time to help them in the healing process. And this is quite detrimental uh, as, as an approach because we do know now from our evidence that uh, a lot of injuries happen because a previous injury hasn't healed properly. So there's some food for thought there. I'm moving now to a different uh, group of performers, and these are the vocal performers, the singers. And again, I have famous people here on your slide, just because um, I don't want to use any, any sort of data uh, protective uh, slides there. These are news that we've all seen, famous people stopping singing, canceling their gigs, cancelling their concerts because of injury in their vocal cords. Do we know the statistics there? Kind of, yes. This is quite an old uh, review. 44% of singers have a vocal problem in a year. I think if we had a similar survey today, we would probably reach about 60%. That is my feeling and from what I understand from my um, colleagues in the in voice medicine. The vocal artists, uh, they're very sensitive about their voice. Most of them, they know routines uh, to recover. They have their own specialist to go to if things go wrong. But there are singers out there, and there are singers in the in the in the music schools as well aspiring singers in the classical world, in the pop world, that have not been uh, trained to look after themselves. And again, this is a responsibility of performing arts medicine to bring the awareness, the health literacy to the uh, young aspiring musicians and also to train our medical uh, colleagues in assessing and uh, giving the right advice to these issues. The vocal injuries can be a range of things, it can be respiratory illness, throat illness, chest infections. Um, I have one right now and I'm looking after the way I talk to you a little bit. Um, but there are, can also be injuries from singing itself. The nodules that you probably have heard, the hemorrhage of the vocal cords, they're all performance-related conditions that can become career-threatening for, um, for these professionals. And now I'm going to move you to another group of uh, performers, and these are the instrumental mu musicians. And uh, I will stay with a few slides on these just to um, scan through a few of these instruments with you and to give you an idea of what the problems may be for these, um, for these musicians. On the piano here on the top left, uh, we have quite a comfortable seating position with the gravity helping our pianist put their um, 
arms and their hands and fingers on the keys. One would think, oh, what can go wrong there? Well, a lot of things can go wrong. Piano pieces are quite long. Um, the repertoire can be quite demanding. And if you have a chance to uh, hear these uh, pianists or even just watch them on a, on, a, on a YouTube video, if you like, you will realize the technique, the speed, the complexity that goes into these uh, repertoires there. And these pianists, they spend hours and hours practicing. A lot of them are solo artists as well. So the demand, the pressures on, on them are immense. And we do have a lot of injuries on the forearm and the hand and the fingers of these uh, musicians. Moving on to the middle picture there, a string player. This is a lower string player, as we call them, a, a cellist. And just imagine yourself having to keep your arms elevated at shoulder level and sort of turned inwards for, let's say, five minutes. And you will understand the pains and the um, difficulty in doing this. These artists are trained to sustaining these positions for long hours in practice and in performance. And on top of that, they have to play their music and transmit, communicate, express that feeling that music will bring to the audience as well. If we think about um, the gentleman at the bottom right there, a uh, heavy brass instrument, those of you who have played or are playing brass instruments, you would know what I mean. This gentleman has to use his hands and fingers to press the valves on the instrument. He has to use some kind of muscles there to support a heavy instrument. This is an extra heavy one, by the way. And then he has to blow into that mouthpiece. So a lot of problems around the facial structures there the lips, the skin of the lips, uh, and also respiration, the lungs, the powers of, uh, of the air going into those instruments. So quite a complex task there with um, very specific training and very specific injuries as well. And I will continue with the instrumentalist musicians just to go through a few more with you. Uh, again, I'm catching a little bit on the brass instruments here on the left. You see a lighter brass instrument, but again, um, this uh, gentleman here is a um, famous musician, of course, for whoever recognizes these, um, these um, guys on, on my photos today. Um, but this is a, a lighter, the, 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 it's a light brass instrument, but again, it has to be played up in the air. Uh, a, a different posture, a different dynamic um, for this particular uh, instrumentalist. But look at the facial structures as well. And this is um, a syndrome that we do, um, a, a pathology, if you like, that we do see in these musicians. Uh, sometimes it needs treatment, sometimes not. But just it gives you an idea of the strain that goes around those facial structures there. And as I said, a lot of respiratory, a lot of um, uh, issues with breathing as well when, when they play these instruments. And the guy in the middle there, the uh, sort of more rock uh, musician there playing on the bass guitar or, or an electric guitar, the posture, the back problems that these people have, the neck problems by carrying a, a, a rather heavy again instrument and moving it around. There's a lot of movement in these uh, performers having to play um, left hand there in this particular um, performer here with the wrist uh, sort of bent and then the, the fingers curling on, on the strings there and the um, other hand uh, playing the fast sort of um, picking on the other strings. Lots of issues there, lots of injuries that uh, we pick up in our performing arts clinics. And last but not least, I'm going to show you here the drummer that you've all, of course, enjoyed, a very physical musician, 
uh, people on the drum kits, particularly. We have percussionists, we have drum musicians that play in other settings, such as a classical orchestra. Uh, they don't have to use such dynamic movement as these ones do here. But for these uh, rock and pop uh, drummers, we see a lot of injuries uh, from their um, the way they play, their shoulders, their back, um, their elbows, their wrists, and uh, occasionally their, um, their legs as well, because there are pedals down there that have to be uh, pressed and coordinated with everything else. Oh, I should have I should have asked you to guess really the percentage of injuries of instrumental musicians, uh, but I don't know what you would have said. Unfortunately, it is very high. Uh, this is mainly um, from the Ackerman study in 2012. Uh, it is mainly on classical musicians, so we don't have the whole lot to assess here, but this is a huge percentage. This is a percentage that really shouts to us that these people need help. And we have the duty to um, respect the extent of these injuries and try to alleviate and help uh, prevent them perhaps as much as we can. This is one of the missions of performing arts medicine. And hopefully if we do another study soon, we will see those numbers dropping uh, Hopefully. This is a problem that perhaps you're familiar with. Again, famous artists here that have um, admitted this problem with their health. And this is what we would call noise induced hearing loss or other hearing problems. These artists, they work in high intensity um, sound intensity environments, and a lot of them suffer with their hearing. This is an area of performing arts medicine that we put a lot of care in prevention. We teach our um, medical professionals, but furthermore, we try to bring a lot of awareness to the um, musicians themselves to use protection for their hearing. Hearing loss is detrimental sometimes, it is irreversible, and you can imagine a singer or a musician having to play with some sort of um, decrease or loss of their hearing. It's quite, um, it's very frustrating, and sometimes it can become um, career ending. So after having said all that, uh, let's come back to performing arts medicine and think about who we are and what we do. Uh, we call ourselves PAM, P-A-M, for performing arts medicine. And we are uh, doctors, general practitioners or specialists, physiotherapists, uh, osteopaths, speech and language therapists, psychologists, nutritionists, and many more, actually. As I said in the very beginning, it is a multidisciplinary field of medicine. And we very, very often need our colleagues um, and we need to form a small team to look after a particular performer. And who do we look after? Well, you, you, you've gathered by now that we look after musicians, dancers, singers, actors, um, crew, film crew, writers, composers, conductors, and many, many others. And what are the health problems? I think you can guess by now. Uh, musculoskeletal injuries, of course, as I mentioned for the dancers, the musicians. Uh, overuse, fatigue injuries. These are the more chronic injuries that people can suffer from these jobs voice, respiratory dysfunction for people in the vocal arts, actors, singers, respiratory dysfunction for singers and people who play wind instruments, hearing, hearing loss, as I mentioned, a big problem in the musical community. And also I'm going to put here on this list, touring, traveling and touring, 
and in big bold letters, mental health. So let me um, give you a couple of slides on these last two uh, problems that uh, I have mentioned here. Firstly, touring. I suppose if you were to come to me today and tell me that, you know, for the next three months, you're going to be on a road trip, you're going to see many places, uh, you might go on a few flights here and there um, in, in uh, all around the world, I would find that quite fascinating and perhaps a little bit glamorous. But believe me, for people who do it because it's part of their job, it is not always as glamorous as it sounds. And I suppose this is why you will see a lot of the um, artists when they announce a tour, uh, it is perhaps one this year and another one five years later. And really these are exhausting uh, times in their lives as much as they enjoy. And I think every artist will enjoy to go out there, meet new audiences, communicate their art, um, you know, gather their fans, everything that comes with it. But at the end of the day, there are challenges there. Time zones, they fly one day, 15 hours, the next evening they are performing. They have to be at their very best. Sleep deprivation, changes in their diet. They move to a different place. They don't bring their packed lunch with them. They have to eat what they're given. Working with different instruments sometimes if they cannot carry around their own um, instruments as with a piano, for example, working into different venues, into different halls, changes in climate, going to damp, um, humid clim climates or, or very hot climates, local risks, infections, epidemics, local medical services. Not everybody travels with their doctor, their physio um, uh, in, in, in the group. They will have to if, if anything happens to them, they will have to rely on the local services. But also the fact that they don't lead a, one could say normal, but what they're used to anyway, day-to-day uh, -day life. Some of them feel isolation. Some of them have disturbed relationships. And some of them, unfortunately, rely on substances such as alcohol and um, drugs to uh, get through these rather intensive uh, times. Mental health. Again, I'm showing you pictures of artists who have publicly declared their struggles with mental health. One of them is not uh, with us anymore. Mental health. Why? Well, if you think about it, there's a lot going on with somebody who uh, performs and performs particularly at a high standard. There's a loss of personal life, there's indiscreet press, intrusion into people's very, very private and personal uh, issues. A lot of these um, performers, actors, I would say more, but not, uh, not only, they feel that um, they lose their identity between who they really are and who they are on stage. Fans are a huge asset for every artist, but sometimes things can become problematic. As I mentioned earlier, substances come into play, unfortunately. Then we have the difficulties in the jobs themselves. As we said, not everybody is famous and in demand. So a lot of these people will fall short of work. And some spirals of depression may start. Financial problems as well, and problems uh, forming um, long-term relationships as well. So just a little bit of a mention there. This is what happened to everyone, but... Um, you can understand how shifting a role, how shifting between stage persona and who I am at home is quite huge for these um, sensitive group of people. I'm showing you, I'm sharing here um, a, a survey by Maxwell et al. back in 2015 uh, from Australia, 
where they assessed a, a big group of actors. More than a third were had drinking uh, problems. Eighty percent would have used at some point uh, some point some some kind of drug. Forty-six percent uh, have declared suffering from a health problem, and more than eighty percent a very big sub, uh, uh, score there for financial uh, stresses. And I'm going to share you, a, again, a rather um, disturbing um, result from a survey uh, that was done uh, back um, in 2016 by Diana Kenny, a very well-known performing arts psychologist, uh, looking at 13,000 uh, plus pop musicians in the United States. And what you can see here, if you can fo follow my arrow, this is the normal life expectancy, um, men and women in the US, and how that life expectancy fell for some of our uh, pop musicians here. These are results taken from death records. And the reasons for that could be either accidents, probably from drugs and other substances there, suicide, homicide, which was quite surprising to see, and then other conditions, heart disease or cancer. Again, could that be related to their lifestyle? So before um, I finish this talk uh, to you today, I'm going to just refer to COVID, just because I, I'm sure you're aware that COVID-19, of course, had an effect on uh, everyone, but particularly on the performing arts populations, it had a, it had a, a very um, negative and a disturbing and concerning effect. So during lockdown, like everybody else, people had to stay at home, they had to home train, their jobs, their shows, they were just shut down. A few of them played, performed online, but I'm sure you will understand this is not the same. No touring was taking place for, for quite a while. If there was any teaching for students uh, in performing arts schools, this was all online. And again, there is no comparison between teaching online these crafts and being in the studio or the teaching rooms. There was loss of income for a lot of artists in the industry. Isolation people are used to work with others, with their cast, their team, their band, their orchestra, and all of a sudden they were all alone. So there was a huge concern. There was worry about what's going to happen. How long is this going to last? And of course, you know, careers were at stake because of this um, anomaly in the sector. And of course, you know, a lot of, like everybody else uh, in, uh, with COVID, um, a lot of the performers fell ill with COVID-19 and some of them are still undergoing the effects of long COVID. And as we all know, particularly in our country here, the UK, there was less access to the NHS for the well-known reasons of COVID-19. And what has been affected? We've seen a lot of injuries. We've seen deterioration of fitness levels, mental health problems going very, very high, um, disturbance of sleep, no uh, efficient rest. Practices were done at home and uh, these compromised safety. There was a blur between work and life balance. A lot of problems with social and emotional life. You know, how am I going to cope? Um, a lot of um, concern about the artistic identity and uh, what is happening now that I am uh, into this pandemic circumstances, and of course effects on the artistic creativity, and a lot, a lot of worry of what happens when I return to work. And if some of you are involved in performing arts, you would know that even now, two years later, we do see a lot of shortages in casts, in performances, and we do see people that have had a great difficulty in returning to their normal or previous or pre-COVID jobs. 
I'm going to show you this uh, pie charts from a fantastic organization, uh, the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. This is an organization in this country that offers uh, free uh, medical assessments to performers of all kinds. And I'm sharing um, just this charts from uh, their records. This is before COVID and this is after COVID here on the right. Before COVID, you could see most of the, um, uh, of, of the uh, pie was taken by the uh, musculoskeletal injuries. This is the light blue on your screen. And uh, the, the dark blue are the hearing problems, the black are the voice problems, and the white bit here is the mental health problems. And then within a year, we had a very um, significant jump of the mental health issues. So this is just an illustration um, uh, to, to sort of give you an idea of how much COVID has affected the mental state of a lot of our artists. Having said all that, uh, I'm now going to take a very positive note and I'm going to um, finish almost my, my talk to you today with um, the optimism that comes with performing arts medicine. And I think all of us that work now in this field feel that uh, we are moving forward and forward and forward. And we do hope that the performers that we treat and we look after feel the same as well. Um, I have here just put out for you just a few of the uh, literature that's out there and there's more and more literature coming, more updated and more specific as we speak. So there's a lot of buzz uh, in performing arts medicine, international conferences, a big global community uh, that I think, you know, um, Will, will show a lot more uh, progress in the future and a lot more help, help for the performing artists. And I think I have to praise um, our own uh, home here, UCL, uh, University College London, because it has shown for now 12 years a huge understanding of the needs of these performers and has embraced performing arts medicine as part of the UCL postgraduate programme. We have three programs at different um, length and uh, certificate, diploma and master's. Now uh, distance learning options as well. We are unique at doing this internationally or we're perhaps at the top, I would, uh, I would say. Um, and we also offer events uh, that are shorter, like day events. We have one coming up uh, called PAM Day on May 13th. Uh, Please feel free to reach out to us if you would like to, to join us. Uh, PAM Day this year is on voice and hearing problems of performing artists. Lots to learn there and understand. And before I say goodbye, uh, I'm going to answer a question that um, um, my colleagues here at UCL um, told me that someone was asking uh, before the, the talk um, started. And this is, uh, is performing arts medicine um, similar to arts therapy? So I'm going to answer that straight away. And I thought I'd put a slide out for that. Uh, arts therapy is quite different. I'm sure you understood by now that performing arts medicine is um, medicine for performing artists. Whereas arts therapy is using the various art forms like music, dance, drama, or visual arts to um, as, as included, if you like, in a program of recovery or management of various populations. So art therapy uh, will help uh, people uh, to um, understand their body better, to address perhaps feelings um, in an artistic way, to explore various activities, uh, and also as what um, we use the term now social prescribing is actually referring people back to the community, particularly for patients who need that social connection um, and need to get out of their uh, isolation or perhaps deal with some mental health issues. So arts therapy, you know, music therapy, dance therapy, drama therapy are quite different from performing arts medicine, but we do interact 
uh, with people that uh, work as arts therapists. So these are performers who work as arts therapists, and we need to look after them as well because you know the chain effect. If they're well, they will um, offer their art and their therapeutic, if you like, um, um, experience to the people who need them most. And I think with that, I'm going to uh, stop now and I'm going to open the floor for any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Sadie. Thank you very much, Hara, actually. That was such an impressive and interesting lecture from you. And just to see the breadth of what performing arts medicine is, I know I learned a lot and hopefully our, our audience did too. Um, just to remind our audience, make sure that you take full use of our time here today with Dr. Truly. Put your questions through to the q and I'm sure she'd be more than happy to answer those. Um, to start with, we've got a few questions in our Q&A already, so I'll kick, those, kick us off with some of those. Um, I heard someone said that they've heard violinist, a violinist, a violinist who their sister works with, who has had practiced so much that they damaged their nerves in their fingers. Would a performing, would a performance medicine doctor or surgeon be involved in the recovery of this um, injury? So um, over damage their nerves from extensive practicing on the violin, basically. Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, this is what, um, hopefully, uh, if, if it came through my talk, um, this is what we do. First of all, you know, we have to go through a particular assessment. The, um, let's say, the musicians' clinics are... Uh, have I stopped sharing? Sorry, Satya, yeah, my, my screen just moved around, I think. All right. So, Fine. Okay, good. Um, yes, um, we in our, in our musicians clinic, we have what we call a special performance assessment. So not only will we go through the usual, you know, let's say interviewing questioning that you will have with your um, doctor uh, or your specialist, but we will also go through your performance history, your performance experience, what happened on that instrument or while you were practicing um, this you know this this course of um, pieces perhaps or uh, what what may have happened there and why have these in nerves if that's the case become injured mm -hmm. and then we will guide the violinist to the right um, professionals if we can't help them ourselves let's say um, there is uh, there is let's say carpal tunnel syndrome just a very common um, pathology in 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 in, um, in musicians, uh, if that is the case, and if we do feel that this is a carpal tunnel that needs surgical treatment, for example, not all do, but if there is that one that needs surgical treatment, then we will refer the patient to uh, a, a hand surgeon or somebody who does that kind of surgeries. Thank you. Um, so I guess we want to know, I, I know want to know, we've got a few people who've asked a little bit more about your journey into kind of performing, performing arts medicine yourself. So what inspired you to get involved in performing arts medicine to begin with? What inspired me? Um, well, I, 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 I thought, I think you, you said in my um, introduction, um, Sita, that I, I did, um, I had music studies as well. So when I was studying medicine, um, back in my home country I also studied uh, for a piano diploma so I was very much involved it was kind of like half half my day and I and since then I always had that um, if you like soft spot when a musician would come to the clinic when I would meet someone you know with problems um, because of what they did in, in, in music playing particularly musicians in my case and I always was looking you know through uh, news and to see if there are other colleagues around the world doing this and there were but they were quite scattered at that time um, and what really got me after many attempts to join various groups here and there and various communities what really got me going was um, a little bit later in my career uh, some of the more inspired colleagues I would say had decided to form um, a postgraduate program performing arts medicine at UCL. So I was um, a student of that first cohort uh, at UCL uh, 12 years ago, and I did the master's. And since then, you know, it's history. I just thought this is what I want to do. And uh, ever since I've been teaching at UCL and working with uh, that particular group of, um, of 
of people. I, I love the story of how you fell into that. And I'm sure as a kid, do you still practice piano today? Is that something that you still... Uh... Oh, you shouldn't ask that question today <laughs> in front of the audience. Because um, <laughs> the, truth, the truth is that I don't. But um, I, can, I can tell you um, every day, there's a little time in my day that I, I, I say to myself, you have to go back and do this. Um, but it, it, that, that day hasn't arrived yet. So, yeah. Well, someone's actually asked, I'm, I'm guessing they have their interests of their own. It's a bit more of a specific question. Is it possible to do the um, performing arts medicine masters within the intercalation, intercalated period at the UCL Medical School? Is that something that's an option available? Um, um, no, it isn't, uh, at least not for now, because uh, it is purely uh, at postgraduate level. Right. So the intercalated ones, you know, they go into uh, undergrads. Uh, for so for us at the moment you know maybe in a few years time but um if 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 whoever's asking the question is a medical student at, at the moment the answer is no but as soon as you finish medical school if you want to join us even um part time we have a flexible program as well we have a program over 5 years uh, if people are doing different specialties or you know training in different fields of medicine that um we can also discuss there you go, the member of the audience who asked that question. Hopefully that answers that one for you. Um, so in terms of then, instead of as an intercalation, would you recommend going into performing arts medicine as a direct route straight from undergraduate? Um, it's like a, if someone did a Bachelor of Science, for example, would you recommend that as a straight undergraduate route? Well, there, there is no intercalated option. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's quite clear. Um, if I understood your, the question well, say that if, if people wanted to do performing arts medicine later on in their medical training, mm -hmm. then I would suggest uh, perhaps to have a word with me if that particular person is, is, is listening, only because performing arts medicine is not a one of the recognized specialties, you know, like let's say endocrinology or, you know, uh, other other things, the psychiatry or ENT, you know, throat specialist. These are the recognised, you know, uh, uh, specialisations in medicine. So performing arts medicine isn't. It's a multidisciplinary uh, approach. But if you want to become, let's say, somebody who looks after uh, bones and joints and things like that, like my my background is, then you will probably go and do a a, a specialty within that. Um, group of, of specialties. You can become a musculoskeletal physician or a sports therapist, um, a sports um, medical, if it's a, if we're talking about medical people here, um, or a rheumatologist, for example. And then you can have that extra training on a flexible scheme, perhaps, uh, with us to get more familiar with these performers' um, injuries and uh, problems. Um, and, and then you can integrate the two into your special interest. Got it, thank you. Um, someone here is asking for a friend. Um, they have a friend who practices guitar every Wednesday and they would like to know from your advice whether you'd advise them stopping or continuing playing the guitar. I'm assuming the way the question is asked is about avoiding injury or whether they should continue if that's something that's causing them um, particular strain. Um, yeah, I think maybe this, this is something hidden in that question and I haven't quite understood it, but um, no, 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 nobody would ever, ever, ever say to anyone, don't practice your instrument because mm -hmm. there are some injury risks there. Um, we don't say that for even the most at risk, you know, um, sports or even, even sort of dance circus applications there. People do play their instruments because they love doing that. It's part of their life. It's part of their expression, their personalities, you know, their love for the arts, uh, the communication, their, their needs. So they have to practice. Whether uh, the, the, the practice is a healthy practice is a different question. But again, not everybody has to go to, you know, a course or a doctor to learn about these things. Hopefully they will become more known as well performing arts medicine becomes more popularized a little bit in, in, in that sense. 
but you wouldn't stop anyone playing the guitar. If there are problems, if that particular individual we're referring to has problems already or has is developing some sort of concerns, then by all means, come and talk to us and we can, we can give some advice as well. Uh, particularly the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine is very open to seeing uh, students as well as um, professionals. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm glad you actually touched on that just briefly just now. You are mentioning how performing arts medicine is becoming more popular, something that people are more aware of. Do you think that is, why do you think performing arts medicine therefore is not prioritised as much as sports medicine? Is that part of the awareness issue or is there something else playing in, in play, like perhaps funding? What do you think is kind of the reasoning behind? Yeah, there, there are quite a few reasons. I think one of the reasons is the fact that um, the physicality, particularly for the musicians, was not always sort of, um, you know, highlighted. Uh, there are some social issues as well around performing arts medicine, unfortunately, and that is, um, I'll give you an example, an injured athlete uh, will return to the pitch and will keep playing the matches and will, you know, keep earning a lot of money if, if they're hired by, by a big team. Whereas a performing artist, a musician, for example, you know, if they're injured and they can't play their violin, uh, there are a lot of employment risks there as to whether they're going to be kept into the, um, you know, the, in the orchestras and, um, as, as, and, and also whether they're going to find another job later on. So a lot of social pressures are there as well uh, that have kept performing artists from declaring their problems. They're more used to working with um, pain, mm -hmm. addressing the issues themselves. And you mentioned funding there as well, Zeta, and I think that's another big uh, factor uh, why performing arts medicine is not as well known as sports medicine. Uh, and I think funding, you know, the money that goes into the resources is, um, is limited. So hopefully, again, by bringing this awareness to the people who do the policies and who take many uh, so we take the you know the decisions on on where funds should go, then you know helping and supporting performing arts medicine is very very important. And I did say that uh, in this country, performing arts medicine, the, the the organization that supports the BAPAM is a charity. They are funded by uh, great organizations, uh, and uh, the money that comes is really charity money. So it would be great to see, you know, state money, government money coming into that as well. Uh, and I'm sure performing arts medicine will be much more better applied in many, many ways. Okay. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned the idea of, you know, performers not necessarily wanting to di disclose their injuries because of contractual obligations or wanting to continue working. What other issues would you say kind of would be, I guess, unforeseen when someone talks about performing arts medicine, aside from, like you mentioned, some of those contractual obligations? Are there any other challenges that you have come across with patients that aren't just about them and their specific injury, but kind of the more holistic environment around them? Yes, um, you're very right. And that's a very interesting um, sort of question to ask, um, I think. There are. And the, the problems can start sometimes from the actual... Um, training environments you know the, the colleges mm -hmm. where the uh, the people will go the young people usually go and train to become performing artists um issues like um competition peer pressure uh huge expectations talented people that go into these professions and um the demands are immense on their capabilities and after all you know these are human beings they may have a skill or a talent but they're human beings we see a lot of um a, a lot of compromise in physical and mental health because the expectations are huge again they don't want to declare pains and aches or mental health issues for example they don't want to share those sometimes they're afraid they will not get the grades, they will not get the recognition, they will not be picked up for auditions, um, you know, exams will go wrong, 
and all sorts of things. So a lot happens in that um, initial environment of the of the training, the, the the colleges, the schools, and then when they move into the careers, into their professional paths, again there is a stigma there. People don't want to to, um, to declare uh, their problems in, in public, and not even public, but not even to their to their immediate group. Um, and again, we do cheer every single artist uh, from the um, celebrity artists, you know, that come forward and uh, talk to us about the challenges with their health, whether that health is performance related or non-performance related. You know, we've had every time we hear about somebody we feel because they're in the public eye and it's big news usually if somebody is not well. But on the other hand, uh, they 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 bring that awareness, they sort of shave off a little bit of that stigma every time somebody comes forward. I mean, that's, I'm glad that that's kind of, we're working towards that, absolutely, it's a critical part of it, really. Um, so we have one more question someone's asked. Um, how would you suggest our audience finds out more about performing arts medicine, or any, any kind of resources that you could suggest or signpost to people to find out more? Well, um, to find out about it, well, you can read about it. There's, there's quite a bit on the web as well, just as a general thing. Um, but if you want to be a bit more specific uh, about it, if you want to find a, a little bit more about it, depends where where you are, where, where you know what's your background. So I, I don't want to generalize too much. I'm very happy to answer to any questions, or if somebody wants to reach me out on on my UCL email, there, uh, more than more than pleased to do that. Um, and as I said, um, us uh, here at UCL, we do run these events and one is coming up in a couple of weeks. So if that's an interest that, um, you know, a bit of a spark in there for you, um, please feel free to um, to to join us. Um, this is a time where we meet, we meet, other, you know, each other, we, we sort of network, we find out what people are doing and it's great. It's good fun. There you go. So anybody interested, make sure you check out 13th of May. Is that right for the event? It's called Pam Day and it's on the UCL um, events, short courses. There you go. Check it out if you're interested in going. I'm sure it will be brilliant. So we are sadly out of time for our, sec for our session today. Um, so we'll need to leave it there. However, if our audience, please, if you could provide us with feedback from today's session by filling out our survey which will be sent to you following today's event we would really appreciate that help us to keep improving our sessions um, also we do have another fascinating lecture titled making inroads into the early diagnosis of lung cancer taking place on the 9th of may with our very own sam james professor of respiratory medicine at ucl so we would love to see as many of you there as possible and the details for this will be sent out um, and available on our website. So please make sure you take a look at that if you're interested in coming along. And again, thank you so much to our audience for all your comments and your questions. And Tara, brilliant lecture. Thank you so much for joining us today and for delivering such a fascinating and interesting lecture to us. And to everybody and yourselves, take care, enjoy your evening and bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. <laughs>